Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me here. Hello and welcome. As we proceed with the NDTV World Summit, we've already touched upon India's economic growth ambitions for the next few years. And as India races towards becoming a $5 trillion economy, we now discuss the role of women shaping this future in India. From business and entrepreneurship to politics, education, and social leadership, Indian women are at the forefront, breaking barriers and setting new benchmarks. In this session, we explore how the Indian businesswoman is fostering the future, creating new paradigms of leadership, innovation, inclusivity, and progress in a rapidly evolving global landscape. And to highlight this, and the role that women are playing in the nation's growth and transformation, I have with me a very powerful panel. I have with me Kamya Vishwanath. Uh, she's the president, Middle East, Indian subcontinent, and Africa for FedEx. Preeti Bajaj, CEO and MD, Luminous Power Technologies, and Padmaja Ruparel. She's the co-founder, IAN Group. Thank you, all of you, for joining me. It's extremely uh, coincidental that all three of you actually are uh, uh, part of uh, sectors which are essentially being male-dominated. So I'll start with Kami with you first. Logistics, again, traditionally male-dominated. So what are the glass ceilings that are yet to be broken? Thanks, Achetna. Um, I think there is a lot more work to be done, so let me start by saying that. Um, and FedEx, as a uh, global corporation that works across uh, multiple international markets, I think we recognize the power of building a, a global culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And 36% um, of our board uh, is women. We have 26% women um, across management globally. Um, our DEI council um, sets priorities and tracks progress against those. So our approach is quite structured. And we recently added opportunity to diversity, equity, and inclusion to rededicate ourselves to inclusive hiring and promotions and uh, supporting career paths. Um, I think the biggest work we have in front of us is how do we increase the representation of women in the logistics and supply chain sector? And I think that starts at the top of the funnel. Uh, with increasing the number of women candidates that apply for positions in this sector. And that includes uh, changing preconceptions and, and biases. The other big area of focus as we see it is middle management, mm -hmm. where we see typically a drop off in women's participation uh, due to added responsibilities and societal expectations around childcare, elder care, um, and, and so forth. Um, FedEx is a very people-centric culture, and a lot of our efforts around DEI have been around how do we build a culture where DEI thrives. Mm -hmm. um, so inclusive leadership training, for example, where we work with managers on how do you manage diverse teams. Um, and we have senior leaders talking quarterly to our teams about how can you be intentional about inclusion. And we have a program called Walk in Someone Else's Shoes. Um, that, that helps build empathy uh, for people of uh, different diverse backgrounds and, um, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, I, I think um, there, there is a lot more to be done. It's an ongoing journey uh, for us, um, and we're always striving uh, to do better, uh, particularly around um, how do we bring in more women into the, the sector, how do we ensure the right career pathways with the right supportive policies, and how do you increase the proportion of women in senior management, which is ultimately, the, the I think, the biggest challenge. The um, and, very and important points you're making, Kami, because data shows us that while you have women in middle management, the participation reduces significantly as they move up the ladder. I'll take the same question to Preeti. Uh, you know, globally, energy as a sector has very few women. Energy technology, you see fewer. So what are your initiatives to take the tribe along, so to say, as you see more women participate in senior management? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very delighted to say that at least at Luminous Power Technologies, the senior leadership team uh, constitutes 33% women. So out of a 12 people leadership team, we have three women at the table really making a difference all day, every day. However, uh, the way I look at it is multidimensional. Uh, I'll describe it in three A's. 
The work that needs to be done in the energy sector is the first A is access. Equity of access to opportunities. That's super critical and that's really about the same sort of thing that Kamini was talking about. Top of the funnel, making sure that you're intentional about the caliber of women and they're getting equal representations on recruitment lists and that we are able to address the biases sometimes that come in. The second bit is ambition. This is a two-way street in my opinion. Um, women have to aspire to field roles to get to senior leadership roles. Uh, even as I sit here today, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to sales and sales operations role, perhaps uh, plant management roles. These are areas of opportunity we are intentional about. But that ambition, that desire to pioneer that is also something that the candidate or women themselves have to fuel. So equity of ambition to do that job has to come from the participant and the company is responsible for creating the environment. The third A in my view is attainment. Attainment is about the environment we create of support, possible policies and at Luminous we do that through of course uh, equal policies wherever possible, safety of uh, transportation, all those things that we can potentially address. When it comes to energy, my Call to action to all the women would be, this is a revolutionary time in energy. It is also a bigger revolutionary time in India. So if you had to be, uh, you know, really thinking about climate action, you had to think about how you're uh, included in shaping the narrative of the future of the country, being in the energy sector is not necessarily optional. And this time, we should make it a point to not miss the revolution. We should be part of it, so that we are part of the 2047 Viksit Bharat, so to speak. Right. But I'll pull you into this conversation. You know, uh, there are more and more women entering uh, the space of investment. Uh, but when you really started out, it, you were quite a lone warrior at that time. How much has uh, the space changed? A, what are the new, what are the glass ceilings that remain to be broken? Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me here. And I'd like to actually take an opportunity to congratulate NDTV on the launch of their world channel. I think it's going to be something to watch out for. So congrats. Um, you know, that's true. When, we st when I started life in this field, uh, there wasn't anybody. And that was the fun of it. And I think, sometimes I think it was a woman who could do it. You know, there was so much, so much adaptation. There was so much education. There was so much evolution that I went through that I think that perhaps tinges on a woman's intuition to say this is what I need to do. So uh, I, th I honestly think I can't be an investor if there are no entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a startup investor. I'm an early stage investor. And I can't be an investor if there are no entrepreneurs. If we look at India's entrepreneurship, yes, it's grown. But there is a very abysmal uh, growth of women entrepreneurs, right? And even more abysmal is the fact that funding is rare, mm. right? Last year or the previous year, sorry, 2022, we had 14.7% of funding that went to women. 23, it's dropped to 9.7. That is not encouraging. Mm. So I think one big thing is that women entrepreneurs are very rare. Right. If they're not going, uh, yes, of course, there are some who've made it. I, I don't deny that. But majority of them are not going the whole path. And that is something where it's a clear goal for all of us, be it investors, be it a woman, be it an entrepreneur, be it anything. We need to nurture that and grow that. Otherwise, I think as a woman investor, I don't think I would have done justice to that. That's, that's the entrepreneur part. Mm -hmm. I think the investor part, to be honest, uh, we've seen investors sort of uh, uh, women striking out and creating women-focused funds, women investors, partners. I mean, we have a few and we are getting a few. But the interesting part, and this is also reflection of the investing landscape of India, that growth money is much, much lesser for women founders. Mm -hmm. And it also tells you that growth funds, there mm -hmm. are not enough women partners or senior people driving right. that. And that is where you see a linkage where 
young women led companies are not go growing rapidly mm -hmm. many of them are falling off the radar yeah. so to my mind i think the aspiration if i had to sort of enunciate that mm -hmm. from an investor perspective it's very clear to me we need to create the black rock of india led by a woman then we'll make it Mm. That to me is what will drive the entrepreneurship. I mean, if there is money, there's no reason why entrepreneurs will not start. And if they are good entrepreneurs, there's no reason why investors will not come. So to me, that's a symbiotic thing, a relationship. And if it's driven by a woman, my hope is that we've invested in 23% mm -hmm. of our portfolio is led by women. Uh, 90 board seats in our 230 companies are women, mm -hmm. I think we can do much better if we right. had that thinking. We'll move to another symbiotic relationship. We'll talk about India's expanding growth ambition and uh, the role that you and your companies are playing in propelling that growth. I'll begin with Kami again. How is FedEx adapting to India's expanding economy and how are you doing that by optimizing your supply chains? Yeah, FedEx is a global connector. And uh, we facilitate global trade across uh, 220 countries. Uh, we see tremendous growth opportunity in India with the expanding economy. Uh, global businesses are looking to set up uh, operations um, and exports out of India to serve international markets. We see that particularly in areas like high tech, electronics, and aviation. Um, Indian large businesses are looking to grow global and acquiring assets in global markets. The small and medium segment, uh, both in terms of cross-border, uh, B2B, as well as e-commerce, um, is, is growing very fast. Mm -hmm. So there is growth across the board in India. And we are investing in capacity from Asia to India and India westbound uh, to Europe and the US, and um, also making investments in our hubs and gateway infrastructure in Delhi, Mumbai, and Bangalore, as well as the, the Middle East. Um, in, in this current environment, uh, supply chain resiliency is very critical for businesses and part of building supply chain resiliency is about alternative supply sourcing and hedging supply risk. Uh, part of it is also about having end-to-end -end visibility of supply chains. And uh, that is why we have taken an approach of integrated logistics where we offer an end-to-end -end solution uh, to our customers across express, freight, air, and ocean, where um, our customers can work with us seamlessly uh, without friction that they would otherwise face with multiple service mm -hmm. providers, um, and also have the visibility um, end, uh, end to end. And our one-stop solution platform enables our customers to manage shipments, uh, book, uh, track, trace, and, and have uh, the, the, the visibility I spoke about um, we're also leveraging data and technology, which I'll, I'll talk about mm -hmm. um, in a minute. But I think our biggest focus is on how do we optimize supply chains and help manage uh, supply chain risks uh, for our customers. Uh, Preeti, I'll go to you next. Uh, the power, the energy sector globally is evolving at such a pace, and technology and sustainability seem to be pro playing pivotal roles there. So how is your business strategy at Luminous making sense of all of this for India? Yes, it is a very dynamic and evol ever evolving landscape. Uh, so as Luminous, uh, we think of it in, in uh, three, three ways. Number one is insight. We are a homegrown brand of India. We have been uh, around uh, the country serving uh, in excess of 100 million consumer homes. So when it comes to insight on usage of energy storage in the home, uh, we've learned a lot about what the Indian consumer expects when it comes to how he or she wishes to use this essential service backup and energy in the home. We bring that insight into what I would say innovation. So very quickly we were able to understand that, okay, the grid has different conditions. What is relevant in UP is not relevant in Karnataka and what is in Karnataka is not going to work in Kanyakumari and whatever is working in Kanyakumari is not going to work in Jammu and Kashmir. Everywhere the grid is different, the consumer expectation is different and the energy storage requirement is different. 
And then it made us realize that when we think about solar solutions for Indian consumers, we have to think about it in the terms of off-grid, something that can work without the grid ever being connected, hybrid, which means the grid is connected as well as can serve as a power backup unit with solar panels and battery packs, and finally, grid tied, which is essentially where you can produce your energy and sell it back to the grid as well. And what's interesting about all this is that these dimensions, the more we travel the world, we realized are so unique to India. Mm -hmm. They're so unique to India. Right. It's not the same thing anywhere else in the world. Uh, and the third piece, what I would say, is when we think about that, Indian consumer has always been at the nexus of, uh, I'm loving the three A's, so I'll start again, affordability of energy, <laughs> accessibility of energy, and availability of energy. Mm -hmm. So whatever you create in terms of solutions, you've got to think about those three A's and feed it into that. So to that effect, I'm very proud to say that, you know, we, we build our own solar panels. Uh, right. We build every part of a solar power generating system. Mm -hmm. Part of it is making sure that there is availability and part of it is making sure that there is affordability. Mm -hmm. And the last piece I'll say, I've spoken about the insight, the innovation, and I've spoken about the industrial ecosystem, if you think about it. The last piece, the fourth piece, is the Indian talent. Right. India has a lot of talent. And when mm -hmm. we think about, well, we want to make in India, in our seven factories, and the eighth one is coming out of the ground, we think about how will we actually take this aspiring talent and expose it to technologies that make a difference. Right. So mm -hmm. if you're sitting here today, I can share with you, and we never think about India in these terms, so of please uh, indulge me in my passion. <laughs> we have been using distributed energy storage, which means batteries in the home longer than any other country in the world. But for some reason, we never recognize that. Yeah. And now that we've recognized it, it's really, really critical that we are proud of it, mm -hmm. yet making leaps and bounds to make sure that this is evident. And therefore, connectivity is super important. Absolutely. And that's why we think about our solutions. That's all. I will stop now. <laughs> Thanks, Preeti. Padmaja, you know, we see a lot of startup activity in uh, being driven by tier two and tier three cities of India. Do you think that entrepreneurship has truly democratized in the country? You know, Suchetna, so this is... Um, this is a very interesting question, but let me answer it in a slightly different way. Um, of course, if you look at UPI, if you look at ONDC, if you look at India's digital digitization, it's, it's, it's natural that this is going to happen, right? Democratization is going to happen. But to me, technology is largely a tool. It's mm -hmm. accelerated startup activity, it's accelerated business, it's accelerated and eased life, right? But the reality of it is lying somewhere else. And let me, let me share that in four examples rather than giving you points, right? Um, when you go to two, tier three, tier four, tier two kind of cities, India, we talk about India as still developing. There are real problems that people, citizens of those towns and cities face. And those problems, they understand very well because they are local. And because they're local, they also need a solution. So they start building a solution there and then. And that is not the only democratization of startup activity. It is creating some very innovative technology-enabled solutions for real problems being bred in India, operationalized India, and which can go global, mm -hmm. right? So let me give you four examples. There's a company called Pool, born in Kanpur, right? What was the founder worried about? He saw flowers that we, when we go to prayer in, in the temples, we give flowers, we pay our obeisance. Those flowers were going into the Ganges, and he saw the Ganges Be messed polluted. up, polluted. Yeah. So he collected that flowers, and out of that flower waste, created incense and personal oils and a whole lot of other things. But that's not where he stopped, okay? He created an alternate to leather, right? Guess who his mentor is? His mentor today is the founder of one of the four global companies. I won't give you the name, but it is one of the Meta, Amazon, Netflix, Google founders. Wow. So that's a 
product born out of waste, mm -hmm. out of the Ganges, literally, mm -hmm. and gone global, mm -hmm. right? Second one, think of Kerala, tier two, right? Company called Gen Robotics. So his family, somebody in his family, actually having to clean the sewers, right? Mm. Created a robot, robot to clean sewers. It's now partnering with all the municipalities in South. Right. Gradually scaling up. Mm -hmm. Real problem, life is messed up for those sewer cleaners. He's created a solution. Right. Right? Third, there was the COVID. Pandemic mm. happened. We have phenomenal engineers in this country. Born in Kanpur, they were doing a solar, a robotic waterless solar panel cleaners. Mm -hmm. Pandemic came, lockdown came, company was completely stalled. And they would have died. Right. In 95 days, they created a smart ventilator where not only were the patients saved, but also the healthcare providers maintain their social distance, mm -hmm. right? Which was internet in enabled, it was smart, it had everything that it had. Today, that, that company is pushing to export to Africa, right? Again, a locally mm -hmm. born company in a tier two con uh, town, yes. born out of a need and a problem, yep. created it in 95 days with all the approvals that mm -hmm. were required at that time, contracted with BEL, has now got installations in tons of hospitals in this country and are pushing to go to Africa, right? Yeah. And the last example, outside of Udaipur, there is a whole uh, colony of carpenters, mm -hmm. right? Shisham wood, if you know Shisham wood, they are carpenters who are building furniture, creating mm -hmm. furniture out of Shisham wood. They were not earning well. Yeah. Great craftsmanship, but could not earn. Company called Wooden Street brought them together and today Wooden Street is selling across the country over 100 outlets and online. Right. right. So born out of need, born out of real problems, entrepreneurship is not something that we can get away with. Mm -hmm. That is our DNA and right. that is what we will do. We know 200 years ago yeah. that was our DNA. It has just come back. That's Very inspiring it. stories uh, that we hear from the tier two, tier three cities. We've completely run out of time. There's so many questions I still have for you guys. I think we'll take it outside this uh, podium. Thank you very much once again, Kami Vishwanathan, Preeti Bajaj, Padmaja Ruparel for taking the time out on a busy Tuesday and being here. Thank you very much once again.